Great. Yeah. <laughs> um, I decided to do a live stream. This is going to be a short live stream because um, to tell you the truth, the, the thought of doing a video, I, doing a video is fine, but, but the upload is like a whole hassle. So I figured I'd just uh, go ahead and do a live stream instead of like a, a, a proper upload. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I've had uh, like a lot of stuff to do today. Um, it's been a complicated day and I'll tell you all about it. Hit me, of course, with the uh, famous, uh, where is Tiffany Dover? If you can see and hear me properly, I'd appreciate it. I'll wait for chat to catch up. And let me just uh, consult my notes here. Uh, let me see, where is Tiffany Dover? Great, you all can hear me properly, that's fantastic. Yeah, I gotta shave. Yeah, I look a little bit like a, like a guerrilla fighter, you know, or, or maybe like a drug dealer in the middle of some shady deal, you know? Yeah, man, the glasses don't help. I gotta get new glasses. Actually, I was in the process of getting new glasses when this whole unpleasantness popped up, you know? As soon as it's done, I hope to go and uh, pick them up. And by the way, I, uh, at this time, I'm thinking that the war will probably end at the end of April. I think that it's pretty clear that uh, Kharkov, at least, will probably fall by the end of the month, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks. And after that, the Russians are going to turn their attention to Lviv and the west of Ukraine. And, uh, you know, they'll have that sewn up, I'm guessing, by the end of April, maybe, maybe mid-May. Assuming, of course, that uh, the United States and NATO doesn't uh, stick their noses into business that does not concern them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very worried about that extremely worried, especially as of late, because there's this vibe as if, you know, the, the possibility of NATO intervention is decreasing, which I think increases the chances of some sort of false flag or some bullshit going on. Yeah. And so that's, that has me very concerned. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like I said, I'm going to just talk for like a half hour. Or so I don't want to like, you know, overstay my welcome. I don't, um, when I'm on my own, I don't really like talking for hours and hours because I feel kind of stupid and maybe I'm thinking that I'm boring you guys silly. So um, anyway, uh, let me get cracking. Now, remember last Sunday, uh, um, a week ago tomorrow, the Yavoriv uh, center uh, outside of Lviv, about um, 12 miles, roughly 20 kilometers from the border with Poland, it was hit by 30 uh, Russian cruise missiles that just completely destroyed the International Peacekeeping and Security Center, which was this uh, essentially a NATO um, staging ground and training center for Ukrainian soldiers. NATO soldiers would show up and teach the uh, Ukrainian fighters all sorts of NATO techniques and maneuvers and tactics and whatnot. Well, that's where the international fighters were stationed. Mm -hmm. International fighters, you know, volunteers, what, call them what you will, you want to call them mercenaries. Mm -hmm. They were basically soldiers from other countries, a lot of NATO countries, a lot of Americans, a lot of Brits. Uh, also a smattering of Latin Americans and whatnot, some Swedes. And, well, they got hit by these 30 missiles. And um, what happened was that uh, the body count at this time, nobody's really clear. They're being very cagey about the number, but it's upwards of 200 reputable um, sources, people who were there, uh, guesstimate that it was about 250, 235, 250. And there were supposed to be about a thousand of these volunteer soldiers at the center. Okay, so roughly a quarter of them got killed. Um, and it's something really interesting. It's something really interesting. It's a message. It's part of a message. The other part of the message happened yesterday in Ivano-Frankivsk. In Ivano-Frankivsk, which is a city also in the west of Ukraine, far west, uh, it got hit by a missile called the Kinzhal missile. Now, this is a hypersonic missile. This travels anywhere from 7 to 12 times the speed of sound. It's unbelievably fast. And what's key about this weapon system, about these hypersonic weapons, is that the, the Russians essentially leapfrogged the Americans insofar as this kind of missile technology, because these missiles are maneuverable. Okay, it's not fire and forget. They're maneuverable and they go so fast and they pretty much hit whatever you want and there's no defense against them. And you might be able to track them. The United States uh, Secret um, Department of Defense is saying that they were able to track these missiles all the way. Great, you could, you could see where it's going, <laughs> yeah. But can you stop it? Mm -hmm. And since it's so fast, 
do you have the time to warn the potential target and get them to get out of the way? Yes or no? And that's the question, right? And now I was uh, looking at Twitter and there was this guy, I'm gonna pick on this guy, and I don't mean it on a personal level, I've never talked to the guy, I have no idea who he is, he just popped up in my feed. And this guy, a guy called Rob Lee, who's got half a million Twitter followers, um, I looked at his bio, you know, United States Marine Corps, um, his, his call sign, his handle is um, R.A. Lee, I think, or R.B. Lee, 85. So I'm assuming born in 85, that would make him, you know, 37 years old. So old enough to know better. Mm -hmm. This guy is getting like a PhD at the uh, War College, some war college in the UK. You know, I mean, he's got like a bunch of credentials, right? And he's an idiot. <laughs> I mean, he's a real idiot, and I'll explain why. Because this guy was saying that the Kinzhal, the use of the Kinzhal, mm -hmm, showed that the Russians were running out of cruise missiles. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, this hypersonic missile, this is the first time it's ever been used in combat. And it was extraordinarily effective. It completely destroyed um, the, the uh, arms depot at Ivano Frankivs. Apparently, it was like an underground bunker with uh, missiles and ammunitions of various sorts and all kinds of sophisticated weapons. And this uh, Kinzhal hypersonic missile, the one missile, <laughs> the one missile hit it and just like tore it up to pieces. I mean, it's gone, gone, gone. Everything that was there is gone the way of the dodo, you know? And this guy, Rob Lee, was saying in these snarky tweets that sounded so goddamn arrogant and stupid, he was saying that, oh, it just shows that the Russians are running out of cruise missiles, you know, and, and sort of like poo-pooing the, the whole thing and not getting the message that the Russians were sending because it was a two-part message. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other, the other, well, actually a three-part message because the other thing that happened is that, see, the uh, Russians also hit some barracks. I, I, I forgot to write down where it was. Um, they killed like 200 officers, Ukrainian Armed Forces officers. I mean, you killed them dead. I mean, just blew them to kingdom come, right? And it's very obvious that the Russians must have known that these officers were there for quite some time and didn't mess with them. And finally, what's becoming apparent is that the Russians are, you know, turning up the heat. They're running out of patience. They're like, okay, we've been at this thing for three weeks. Now surrender already, or we're going to start to hurt you. And yesterday they hurt these officers, killed off over 200 of them in one go. And plus this um, Kinzhal missile in Ivano Frankivs. And uh, what, what's it telling you? Okay. Or what's the message that the Russians are sending? And why is this Rob Lee guy such a fool? Because he is. Because you see, this guy, Rob Lee, is a fool because he's not listening to what the Russians are saying. And what the Russians are saying is if you're NATO, we can hit you anywhere we want inside the Ukrainian border. We own you. So don't fuck with us. Do you want to fuck with us? You're going to find out, and it's going to get fucking ugly. Because these guys at Yaroviv, the, the foreign fighters, right? A lot of them were complaining and saying, we didn't have any air warning, nothing. And all of a sudden, boom, you know? Which, of course, is the point. They got hit so fast that they didn't have any time to prepare. Mm -hmm. And they were like on the far end of Ukraine, far from where the Russian main army is. Uh -huh. And they got hit with pinpoint accuracy. And the word that's coming down is that those mercenaries were probably infiltrated. Mm -hmm. Because the Russians, right, they might not have the sophisticated technologies and the you know, infrared, super high res satellite pictures and whatever the hell, but they're masters at human intelligence. As human intelligence, they are really, really good at that. And so it's pretty obvious that they must have had some sort of uh, inside information. And that's how they hit the Yavoriv Training Center, mm? the Peace International Peacekeeping and Security Center. <laughs> it's a NATO center, and they hit it hard. Mm? And that was probably the center that NATO was planning to use to, like, put their initial troops or something, you know, in a potentially offensive into Western Ukraine against the Russians, right? The Russians hit them so hard that that place doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And the weapons depot in Ivano-Frankivsk, right? Like, 
the weapons that the West is planning on sending into Ukraine, and the, the Russians sent the Kinzhal missile, what's the message there? The first time they've ever used a hypersonic message, uh, missile, what's the message? What's, what, what, are, what knowledge are they trying to impart to their potential opponent, to NATO? They're trying to tell NATO, you bring in weapons and we will hit them 100%. And your weapons into Ukraine, they're going to have no effect whatsoever on the battlefield because as you bring them in, we will wipe them out time after time after time because we did it this one time, the first time, and we bat batted a thousand. You don't think that we're going to bat a thousand the next time any weapons come into Ukraine? That's the message. And guys like Rob Lee, they're saying, oh, you know, they're running out of uh, cruise missiles. I mean, you know, even if that were the case, which I don't really think so, but even if that were the case, right, the guy is not listening to the message that the Russians are sending. See, when you are worried that somebody is going to get involved in a fight, what you do is you make a show of force. And a show of force so devastating and so surprising and so harsh that the other guy figures, you know, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to get into this fight. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that guys like Rob Lee, who is the prototypical guy who's in the U.S. Pentagon and the U.S. State Department, the typical guy who's got all the credentials but no experience, he's got the IQ points, he's got bazillion IQ points, he's smart, and he's educated, and he's got all the credentials, but he has no judgment. And this is the problem with most of the people, if not all of the people, in the U.S. State Department and the U.S. Department of Defense. They don't have judgment, so they don't read the really obvious signs. And why don't they have any judgment? Well, because, see, these institutions, they promote people who are spotless. They promote people who are compliant, who do all the tasks that they are assigned, jump through every hoop like the good and compliant little doggy. Hmm? Good doggo, jumping through the hoop and getting the PhD, jumping through the hoop and getting the accreditation and the certificate and whatever, jumping through the hoop and getting the fellowship to some school where they will learn nothing of any value. They're spotless people who've never failed, who've never gotten the ever-living shit kicked out of them, so they have no judgment. Because the thing is, see, and I can tell you from experience, you get judgment. Oh, oh, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Mm. You get judgment. Oof, I wanted to sneeze very badly. Hey, hang on a second. Sorry about that. Ah, problems with a live show. You gain judgment from your mistakes, from your failures, serious failures. See, I've been very, very successful, and I've, I've had heartbreaking failures. And the successes led me to believe that I was so smart. Mm? That I was so smart and so clever and all the rest of it. But my failures showed me that sometimes work, hard work, the hardest work of your life, and doing everything right is not enough. Sometimes you make mistakes without realizing them. Sometimes things happen. Sometimes it's just bad luck. Failure teaches you judgment. But the problem is that the people in leadership, they never fail. And if they ever do fail, they're edged out. They are no longer in the running. And so you have people like this Rob Lee fellow, and I want to say, I've never heard of the guy. He just popped up in my feed, you know, 20 minutes before the show, literally. He popped up in my feed, I started reading his shit, and I was like, this guy's a fucking moron. But then I realized he's not a moron. He's a very bright guy and a very hardworking guy, but he has no judgment. He's never failed. What was really interesting was he reading the accounts of these um, mercenaries who, you know, who got hit last Sunday, you know, they're calling them uh, the Reddit warriors in some places. That's a pretty amusing title. Um, these Reddit warriors, right, they ran away and they wrote in Reddit and their different out, um, you know, outputs and different platforms and whatever. And they went on and on and on. And what was really obvious, one of the things that really struck out, that stuck out to me, was that they were saying, you know, what happened with the air cover, you know, and, and air protection and air defenses and stuff? 
And see, what happens is that these guys, the American military in particular, they're so used to having overwhelming air superiority mm, that they don't know how to fight. Mm, that's, that's the message. That's part of the message that the Russians were sending. Mm -hmm. See, the American mode of war, what is it? They go into some country, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and they blow up everything. They use their air superiority to just drop bombs everywhere. And after they've completely leveled the city, turned it into fucking rubble, they've destroyed the electrical grid, the, uh, the cell phones, uh, water mains, everything. They just blow it all sky high. And then their army rolls in. And their army rolls in and they have like these mobile phones where they can talk to an AWACS plane and the AWACS plane tells them exactly where everything is and how things are going. And if they get into any kind of trouble, they just call in an airstrike and blow away anybody who's getting in their way. They don't know how to fight. That's the problem with the American military. They don't know how to deal in, with a situation where the enemy, the enemy has the strength in the air and air defenses to really fuck their shit up. Mm -hmm. And that's the message that the Russians were sending. Mm -hmm. This uh, Kinzhal uh, hypersonic uh, missile, right? You know what it's designed for? It's designed to sink an aircraft carrier. That's what it's designed for, <laughs> okay? I mean, people say that you can put a nuclear weapon on it. Yeah, but you know, nuclear weapons, you can put them on practically anything nowadays. They're so small, but that's not the point. The point is a missile like that where you cannot defend against it because it's just flying too fast. It can hit an aircraft carrier and it can sink it. Mm -hmm. That's what it was made for. And the message that the Russians are sending is, you fuck with us and you're gonna find out. But the problem is that the American leadership is filled with guys like this Rob Lee fella. Mm -hmm. Guy with all the credentials, lots of IQ points, lots of education, but no judgment. You know, it was so interesting, you know, he had this, um, this pinned tweet where he was talking about, you know, uh, when Russia might move on Ukraine. And it was really interesting. He talked about Russian behavior. Russian behavior? Like the Russians are like a dog or a monkey or something like that? Huh? He didn't understand that Russians are motivated by rational concerns. He just looked at it as behavior, behavior like you know, animalistic, like the reflexive attitude of an animal, because an animal lives on reflexes, lives on hardwired reactions, emotional reactions to his environment, you know, because it's a dog or it's a monkey or it's a donkey or it's whatever other animal you care to name. They're not rational, but human beings are. Human beings don't behave. They act, they act rationally. But this guy, Rob Lee, and guys like him, who are all over the Defense Department, all over the State Department, they look at Russia, an opponent, and they don't look at them as if they are rational actors. They look at them as if they're simply behaving. And that is a huge blindness. That basically leads these fools to look at their opponent and not see how their opponent can fuck their shit up because their opponent is rational and the opponent is looking at them, studying them and figuring out how can I fuck this guy up in a way that is gonna really surprise the fuck out of him. Huh? And because guys like Rob Lee, guys like in the Defense Department and the State Department in the US, they don't look at their opponents as rational actors, but merely as people who behave, huh? They can't anticipate what will happen. And so they get surprised. And in their surprise, what happens is that they start to behave. They start to act based on emotion, irrationally. And that's where the problem of nuclear weapons comes in. That's when we get into real trouble. Because it's morons like this Rob Lee fellow who starts acting like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, they 
killed all our guys. They destroyed our nuclear aircraft carrier. We, we have to do something. We have to show them. We have to show them that we're tough. We have to show them that we're tough. We have to throw a nuclear weapon on them to show them. Because who do they think they are? How can they behave this way? My great concern in this whole conflict is that NATO gets involved and imbeciles, overeducated, high IQ imbeciles with no judgment whatsoever, freak out over losses that could have been easily predicted if they'd had a little bit of fucking judgment. They freak out over their losses and they start nu using nuclear weapons. That's my great fear. And the Russians, it's very obvious, they are doing everything in their power to scare NATO into not coming into this situation. That's why they killed off all those um, soldiers, those uh, mercenaries, or whatever you want to call them, volunteers. That's why they killed them all off last, uh, last Sunday. And the others went running. They went running scared shitless, okay? That was part of the Russians' message. And hitting ivano frankivs with a hypersonic missile, that was the second part of the message. And there'll be more messages like this, where the Russians from afar, from hundreds of kilometers away, are just going to hit targets hard in the West, just to show that the second NATO crosses that border between Poland and Ukraine, it's open season, and the Russians are going to hit them, hit the Americans, hit NATO so hard. And the whole point of these messages that the Russians are sending is to make sure that NATO understands, stay in your fucking lane. But like I said, my great concern is that people like this uh, Rob Lee don't understand the message because they're too stupid. Mm -hmm. They have no judgment because they've, you know, lived these little spotless lives with no mistakes. You know, they've been these compliant little puppies jumping through every hoop, uh, getting their little fellowships. Uh, and since they've never failed, they don't have judgment and they might cause a catastrophe out of arrogance, out of emotionality. That's the thing. And that's the funny thing. See, they think that other people are irrational without recognizing their own irrationality and their own hubris, because ultimately that's what it is, hubris, arrogance. It's a belief that they are so superior to other people to not even consider that other people are in fact people. I mean, the fact that you talk about an entire nation as behaving in a certain way shows that you don't respect them as human beings or as responsible, rational actors. I've been in this war now for three weeks, and I've grown to despise the American military. I mean, I really hate their guts. I think they're cowards. I think they're pieces of shit. In 91, when the first Gulf War happened, I was, what, 22, 23 years old? Not quite 23. And I watched that war, and I was so impressed. I was so amazed. And then, you know, the, all the bombing that went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, and you know, the smart bombs. And you'd see the, the black and white footage of the bomb going, 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 going into the building. And poof, you know. It was so cool, you know. And then I saw other American invasions where they just destroy everything. And I thought, well, you know, that's war. You know, that's, that's how you fight a war. You go to some city and you just blow it up and just level the whole thing. And it's a fucking tragedy. But actually being here. Right? and seeing how the Russians fight a war. Mm -hmm. And I realized that the Americans are fucking pigs. And I mean that sincerely. And I don't give a fuck if you're some American. And if you're some, like, American Marine who's going to, like, beat me up, you know, because of what I say, well, that just proves my point now, doesn't it? You're a civilized animal. I say that to every fucking American soldier because you are. Because I've seen how the Russians are fighting this war. They're not trying to hurt civilians here. I'm in the middle of fucking Kharkov and I see how they haven't fucked with the electrical grid, they haven't destroyed the water supply, how they have left up the cell phones. They're leaving the civilians alone. They're going after the Ukrainian armed forces. Oh yeah, no question. And when the Ukrainian armed forces, or more correctly, the nutso schizo crazies of the Azov battalion and whatnot start to hide 
in like kindergartens, because they have done that, in hospitals, which they have done, in, uh, you know, a apartment complex, civilian apartment complex, which they have done, we have video of them hiding in the top floors, while down below on the first floor, they have a tank hidden in the first floor of the building, and the third, fourth, and fifth floor, it's full of civilians, which they are using as human shields, which is what they are actually doing, yeah? And the Russians are trying to not kill the fucking civilians, but kill these fuckers. And I've seen video of them trying to do it. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, you know, the Russians, whatever you might think of uh, their leadership or whatever you might think of, you know, the, uh, the people back in Moscow, at least here in Ukraine, they are actively trying not to hurt civilians. They are actively going out of their way not to fuck with civilians. It's really obvious. And anybody who claims otherwise, he's just fucking lying. I'm here, okay? I mean, I can tell you. But the Americans, what they do, I mean, that's the funny thing when the Americans are criticizing the Russians, they're like, you know, oh, the Russians, they, they haven't been able to capture the cities, they haven't destroyed it. Because that's all the Americans know how to do, destroy. They destroy everything. And they don't care how many people die as they level a city. Oh, they care, but you know, it's like this performative caring. Like, oh, I felt so bad as I was dropping that 10,000 pound bomb on the hospital and killing all the people there. I felt awful. I'm gonna go to therapy. Fuck off. I mean, really, fuck off. And it's really interesting when you are in a situation where you see how two people act and you've been convinced that one way of acting is the correct way, but then you see the other way of acting. And you realize, holy shit, what I thought was really cool and, you know, just most excellent dude is really fucking despicable and immoral. The Russians don't care about the cities. They're surrounding the cities because insofar as, for instance, Kharkov is concerned, there are a lot of soldiers here. Insofar as Mariupol is concerned, there are a lot of Azov, but Azov battalion people and they want those fuckers dead. And they made it really clear. And I've said elsewhere why that they're interested in killing those fuckers dead. Well, they deserve it. I mean, you know. <laughs> no sympathy for that. But anyway, um, but the Russia and also Kiev, of course, they want to surround and capture Kiev, but not because of the military or the people, because it's the political center of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And they want to capture it, but they want to capture it in one piece. And they've had the weaponry, the air power, the artillery for three weeks now to have leveled Kiev if they wanted to. And they still haven't done it. Why? because they don't want to fucking level it, because they want to capture it in one piece with as minimal damage as possible to the infrastructure of the city and as minimal damage as possible to the civilians. That's what they've been doing. But the Americans, they just destroy. Kill, 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 bomb, 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 bomb. I realize that the American military are barbarians. They're despicable. Because the Russians, for instance, right now, their big thing, the thing that they're just freaking out over and trying their hardest to do, is they've encircled, you know, the, the brunt, the, 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 the bulk, rather, of the Ukrainian combat troops. Something like 60,000 men in about three or four different pockets that they've surrounded in eastern Ukraine near the contact zone, the contact line, with uh, Donbass, right? And they've surrounded them, and they're surrounded, surrounded, and right? that's a fact. And what's really clear is that the Russians want to capture those men. They don't want to kill them. And they're doing everything in their power to get those guys to surrender. Mm -hmm. And the problem, though, that they're having, which is something that some smart observers have picked up on, and, and the guy who beat me to the punch on this is Alex Mercurius over the, at the Duran. Alex Mercurius is just a smart, smart motherfucker. I mean, yeah, definitely. Just a smart mofo, you know? Dude, he's smart. Uh, he pointed out, before I was able to point out here, so I'll just have to take his lead, that, see, when you have um, narrative irreality, mm -hmm. when you have a narrative that you're winning, what happens is that your army starts having an irrational belief as to the success of the mission. See, in Ukraine PR, all the bullshit propaganda that they're spewing, you know, Ghost of Kiev, 13 uh, heroes, all this shit, right? Um, the, uh, whatchamacallit, the, um, the Ukrainians, 
the Ukrainian armed forces are under the completely mistaken impression that they are winning. And so because they think that they are winning, they are holding out instead of surrendering. And see, what's happened is that the Russians have successfully surrounded several nuclei of Ukrainian armed forces, which are cut off from one another in terms of communication, let alone resupply and refueling. Okay, So there are like these nodes in the east of Ukraine, and there are these nodes in Kiev, and there's these nodes in Kharkov and Meliupol and uh, Nikolaev, right? But they're cut off from one another, and they're not going to get reinforced. And so these guys in these different nodes, since they are cut off from one another, and they've been listening to all this propaganda, this narrative bullshit, well, they have this, uh, uh, let's call it uh, um, narrative dissonance. I think that that would be a good term. Narrative dissonance. Mm -hmm. You see, they have this narrative that they're winning, but it, it doesn't correspond to reality because they're losing. But they're hearing that they're winning, that their side is winning. And so they don't want to surrender. And they're fighting. They're fighting a losing battle. And the propaganda of the West of all the mainstream media bullshit and all the Zelensky regime bullshit, it has convinced all these fighters in all these different places that they are winning and therefore they're not going to surrender. And this is a catastrophe because if they actually know, knew how things were, they would surrender. And these men, these brave men, nobody's doubting their heroism or their strength of character or their will or determination, but these brave men, if they knew how bad the situation on the ground really is, they would surrender. They would surrender and they would save their own lives and the lives of their comrades. But since they have this bizarre notion, product of the propaganda, this narrative dissonance, where they think that they, their side is winning, so they're going to keep on fighting to the last man. Well, they're, they are going to fight to the last man, and they're going to die to the last man. And this is why propaganda is so dangerous, see? Because it gives you a completely false sense of reality. And that's what's happened to the Ukrainian armed forces. That's why they're getting cut to pieces. And it's, it's, it, it just breaks your heart, because these are young kids. They have their lives ahead of them, you know? These kids, 19, 20, 23 years old, right? I mean, forget about the officers, you know, the enlisted kids, right? They've got decades ahead of them, and they are going to die for nothing. I mean, that, that's the thing that breaks my heart. And it's because of all the fucking lies. All the fucking lies of the mainstream media. You know, the other day, you know, the, the Daily Telegraph, right? The, the British newspaper... They finally said that, oh yeah, it looks like the Russians might be doing like a, like a mad dash to the north from, uh, from, from the Sea of Azov and to encircle a, a, a Russian, a, a Ukrainian army. And I'm like, dude, they've been doing that since like the, like the third or fourth day. They already closed it. That cauldron is closed. And they are turning up the heat. And they are shelling those men who have no gasoline, they're running out of food and water. They have no possibility of any kind of reinforcement. And because they're, they're not only on the back foot, they're practically falling backwards, right? They have no chance at any kind of counteroffensive, any possibility of breaking out. They're surrounded. They're trapped. And little by little, the Russians are turning up the heat and squeezing them until eventually they will be no more. And all those men will die for nothing because they have this false belief that they're winning because of all the lies being told to them in the mainstream media. And that's the thing. It's not the Russians' fault. It's the fault of the people who are telling the news that are lying and giving a false sense of what's going on. It, it, it just really breaks my heart because all these men are going to die for nothing, see? I mean, like, when you have, like, a desperate battle and you give it your all and you die in this desperate battle, but there's a real chance of winning, that's one thing. But when there's no chance of winning, that's another.
and, and to encourage people to lay down their lives, as the Zelensky regime is doing, encouraging them to throw away their lives on a hope that will never come. That's frankly evil, as far as I'm concerned. Because there is no sin of realizing, like a grown-up, like a rational individual, that your situation is untenable, that you can't win. There's no sin in that, in being realistic. It is painful. It is painful to make that realization that you can't win. But it's what an adult, a rational adult, has to do sometimes. Face the reality that things cannot be won. But these lies keep these brave men from recognizing reality. The false hope keeps them fighting for nothing. And, and that's the tragedy. Anyway, um, okay, anyway, about my own situation, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been a lot of uh, talk on, on local Telegram channels, and I've posted the posts, and, and I forwarded the posts, rather, on my Telegram channel. Uh, you can go check them out there. Uh, well, the SBU, which is the um, State Security Services, or something like that, uh, it's basically the uh, Zelensky regime's version of the KGB. And as dark as that sounds, that's what they are. The SBU, with the uh, local Kharkov police, are going to buildings, one after the other. And they are looking for people who are pro-Russian, or who are um, defeatists, or basically, basically looking for guys like me, <laughs> okay? And so things for me have gotten a little bit uh, dicey. Mm -hmm. And um, I posted those, uh, those uh, I forwarded those posts on my Telegram, and they're in Russian, but I just did a Google Translate, and you can see it there. And um, I'm not gonna lie, I'm scared shitless, to tell you the truth, you know? Uh, this afternoon, or this evening now, after this show, I'm going to be moving on. Um, yeah, I'm scared, but, you know, fear doesn't really help now, does it? So I'm trying to keep focused and uh, make sure that I get to a place uh, that, you know, will be safe and secure, you know, and just uh, keep on moving. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I figure that, you know, every I'll try to be online in one way or the other, or the other on, on uh, Telegram or Twitter, uh, you know, at least, I mean, if you haven't heard from me in 10 hours, then you know they caught me, okay? It's as simple as that. Um, because my great defect is that I don't speak Russian or Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there's, there's that situation that's going on. And um, yeah, but you know, it's manageable. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russians are, getting closer you know every day i hear them more often um yeah what else oh yeah tomorrow i'm gonna do a show with george galloway a podcast the mother of all podcasts i think it's called or the mother of all talk shows yeah the mother of all talk shows i think it's called with george galloway and it's going to be at 9 p.m my time okay 7 p.m london time I guess that's noon Eastern Standard Time. Looking forward to that. That's really cool. Um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting because George Galloway is kind of like a commie, right? He's like a Marxist guy. But it's really funny in these topsy-turvy time, times, a conservative like myself and a commie like him, <laughs> we see eye to eye on a whole bunch of different stuff, which is cool, which is, uh, yeah. Because, see, you got to understand, the people of the narrative, the people who are running shit, these fools who are so irresponsible and so willing to throw away lives with the use of lies and bullshit. Yeah, I mean, like an old school Marxist and myself have a lot more in common uh, than either one of us with these corporatist lying sacks of shit who are running things right now in the West. Mm? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have anything more to talk about. I'm looking here that I've run, uh, run my mouth for almost 40 minutes. So I'm going to go. So great talking to you all. Take care. And uh, I'll catch you next time.